now we are live on YouTube. So enjoy doing opening remarks. <laughs> what again? All right then. Hi, I'm Tom Shrimpton, the Contributed Talks Chair. And on behalf of the RWC Steering Committee, let me be the first to welcome you to Amsterdam for RWC 2021. Now I know we're all really excited about the program, the contributed talks, the invited talks, the lightning round, and certainly for the Levshin ceremony, but you're probably also really excited to get out there and take in some of the culture and the sights and sounds that make Amsterdam the really great city that it is. Maybe you have your mind to go check out the Rijksmuseum. They have some amazing art that you should go. Maybe you wanna go check out some tulips. Hey, that was some fun. Or maybe you're here for some authentic Dutch food like some puffetjes, or to have a cup of coffee with a friend and something slightly more adult to eat. Sadly, I at least can't do any of this because I'm sitting in the four by six rear corner of my master bedroom here in Florida. In any case, I am really excited to welcome you to RWC 2021. Now the good news is that even though we can't be together this year in Amsterdam, we can be, fingers crossed, next year. So the plan is to have RWC 2022 in Amsterdam as we have planned for this year. Helping us to pull off both RWC 2021 and 2022 are a bunch of really generous sponsors. We'd like to take a moment to recognize them and thank them for, uh, in many cases, their continued support of this event. They've helped us to grow it from, uh, you know, 100 people the first year to this year, well over 700 people. One of the things these funds do is allow us to uh, offer support to students to be able to attend RWC. And we also have a special RWC fund just for this that was set up by a generous donation from Eric Rascola, who was a previous Levchum Prize winner. So special thanks to Eric. Uh, that said, of course, I'd be remiss and Nigel would definitely get on my case if I didn't mention that we're always looking for new sponsors. So if you're listening out there and you feel like you want to become a more active part of the RWC sponsorship community, get in touch with Nigel Smart. It's a little odd to have the program chair give the opening remarks. Usually that's the general chair or the local organizer that does that. And they would tell you logistical things like, uh, you know, when the food will be served and where and where the restrooms are and where to hang your coats and things of that nature. So I'll just go ahead and say that I'm assuming that food will be available wherever it's typically available at your place. And it's probably available whenever you want it to be available. And uh, I'm going to guess that you know where the restrooms are in your house. <laughs> I do want to thank the uh, the program committee that I had this year. They were fantastic, and this was a very trying time um, to be on a program committee. I, I imagine many of you in the audience have served on program committees uh, during 2020, and you know how difficult it is to try to balance all the things uh, that come with having kids who are homeschooled and whatnot, um, and and serving on a program committee. So I do want to. A thank you to all the members of the program committee who worked very hard to pick the contributed talks for this year. Special thanks to uh, Dan Bonet and Mihir Balari and Martin Albrecht. All of them went uh, really above and beyond in terms of not just finishing their own load quickly, but then picking up um, you know other papers and, and, and just doing lots. I want to say a special thank you to them. We had 101 submissions this year, which is a significant increase over the previous year. Um, we were already on a, a, a steady climb. 101, I think, is about 30 papers submitted uh, beyond last year's. From those, uh, the program committee worked very hard and picked out 36, which are the papers that you will see uh, over the next four days. In addition to that, we have six invited talks. The overall format of the talks is that the contributed talks that were accepted into the program will have 15 minutes in total, 10 minutes of live presentation, followed by five minutes of question and answer. And if the authors chose to, they also had the option of providing us with a longer format um, talk uh, recorded in video. So you can think of this as kind of being like the, the camera ready version of the paper versus the, the full version of the paper. And then for the invited talks, they have a total of uh, 30 minutes, which we're imagining is something like 25 minutes of presentation and five minutes of question and answer following. Uh, and just before I wrap this up, I want to make uh, really uh, give, give a special, special thank you to Kevin McCurley and Kay McKelly, who um, <clears throat> you all don't know this in the audience, but these two people 
have worked countless hours uh, behind the scenes preparing uh, the RDBC website, the social app, all of the sort of internet related stuff um, that is happening is really all due to them. They have worked a huge number of hours. And were we there in person at this point, I would ask you to stop and give a round of applause to them because they really deserve it. So if you're sitting there in your room and you and you feel motivated to clap, then I strongly encourage you to do so because they have worked super hard on your behalf to try to make this event, which you know is our first virtual uh, conference, um, try to make it really uh, a- a- as close as one can make it to an actual in-person event while still uh, being virtual. So special thanks to them. Well, that's going to do it for me. I've already taken up five minutes of your time. Um, I just want to say again, welcome to RDBC 2021. I can't wait to see all of you in person in Amsterdam next year. Um, if you do happen to run into a member of the program committee in one of the chat rooms, please do thank them for all their work. Likewise for Kevin and, and Kay. If you happen to see a sponsor, thank them for their support of this event. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the program. Hopefully that came off okay. It's the first time I've tried to do a, a video over Zoom. Uh, I don't know if any of the other steering committee members have anything they want to add, or Peter, if there's anything you want to add. Well, you didn't leave much for me to say. There's uh, uh, just two things that I think I should announce. One thing is a technical thing that we just noticed. So if you've been at ISCR conferences, um, virtual ISCR conferences before, then uh, when you're opening the chat, you may not see immediately the uh, RWC 2021 chat. So you need to add that stream on the left side by clicking on add stream and then RWC 2021. And then the second remark is that even with global warming, you would be very lucky to see tulip fields in January in the Netherlands. So if you want to experience those, you'll have to stay around for a little bit longer next year in 2022. So that's um, all from my side and well, also from the general chairs, I'm also speaking, I think, for Leila and Johan. Welcome to the conference. Kenny, you, did you want to say something about the social app? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> there's uh, uh, I just said Kenny, but Kay, do you want to? Oh, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Let me, let me introduce uh, Kay, who was mentioned before by, by Tom. Uh, Kay and uh, Kevin McCurley working together have done an amazing job building an entire app just for this conference with lots of new features. Uh, Kay, I don't want to, we have time if you want to take a minute just to mention a couple of the the highlights of the features that you've built. It'd be really cool to hear about them. Uh, Yes, now actually me. Um, So I will uh, encourage you to check out the social app. You can find it from the conference program. Um, We will be running our social hours through that as well as through Zoom with having um, hangouts, which are sort of like really casual AMAs uh, through Zoom during the social hours. Uh, Those will change each day. Um, And the only other things I would like to say are uh, there may be during the conference a slightly weird different thing from when you've gone to uh, virtual conferences with IACR before. We will be using breakout rooms to diagnose technical issues, address code of conduct, anything like that. So if you see during the talks that breakout rooms have opened, please ignore that. It's not for you unless you were automatically moved into the breakout room, in which case it is for you. Um, and I think that's it, Kevin, is that right? Yeah, I'll just make one comment that I discovered. I was reminded this weekend that, uh, Safari is the new internet explorer and I had to rewrite the distributed protocol for the social app to keep the server from melting down from Safari's inability to keep a web socket open. So use Safari with caution. (laughs) All right, well, if that's it, then I guess we can turn it over to Dave to start the first session. Hi, everyone. This is Dave Archer, um, chairing the session for Secure Channels. So in this first session of RWC 2021, we're very fortunate to have four exciting talks about secure communication channels on untrustworthy networks. Uh, The topics range from formal notions of channel robustness and their impact on security 
to side channel attacks against TLS Debbie Hellman, to attacks against authenticated encryption schemes, all the way to resource efficient post quantum TLS handshake protocols. Uh, so as Tom said, uh, each uh, talk is 10 minutes, followed by five minutes of q and I'll offer an audible two minute warning. Uh, if you would like to ask a question of the presenter, please post your questions in the Zulip channel, not the chat channel here in Zoom. And I'll relay them to the speaker once the speaker's done. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker, Felix Gunther, who will be telling us about new robustness notions uh, for secure channels. Felix, you're on. Now, I hope you hear me now. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. I want to talk to you about uh, a joint work today with Mark Fischlin and Christian Janssen from TU Darmstadt, where we were interested in how quick and DTLS 1.3 behave over an, in, uh, an, an unreliable network. So, as you may recall, quick and DTLS run over UDP to protect application uh, level data. And we were asking ourselves, what does this mean in terms of the secure channel guarantees that Quick and DTLS provide running over this unreliable network? So just to briefly recap, uh, generally in crypto, we think of secure channels as like TLS running over a reliable transport like TCP. So you would have a sender, Alice, sending a bunch of messages, and then Bob would receive them in order, guaranteed by TCP, or if not, um, there might be an, an active adversary interfering, and Bob can tell this and will reject any non-in-order packets and tear down the connection right away. Now, of course, this picture is different if we're running over unreliable transport like UDP, because the network itself might reorder packets, sometimes even duplicate things, stuff may get lost. And of course, we still have potentially an active adversary that we might want to pr uh, protect against on that secure channel. So the question is, how should the receiver uh, handle that kind of uh, incoming messages? And there's many choices. Uh, as said, there is replace duplicates. You have to decide whether you want to prevent them. Quick says you must prevent them. For DTLS, it's optional. You uh, can't do this generally. You have to decide in which kind of window you want to check for replace. Usually, you use a, a sliding anti-replay window here. There is reordering. Well, should you permit this? If you're running over UDP, you have to handle it one way or another. And Quick and DTLS settle for a dynamic sliding window where you would accept uh, incoming packets around a in a certain window around the last packet you received. And the size of that window is determined on the sender side dynamically, actually. Of course, there's still adversarial interaction. You want to maintain integrity and reject non-genuine packets. Both protocols resort to, the AAD pro to an AAD uh, building block for that. Now, we were interested in the question, how do you formally guarantee uh, that those kind of replays, reorderings, or adversary interaction don't affect the processing of other genuine packets? And for this, we coin the, new, the notion of robustness of a channel. Now, before we can go into the security part of that, uh, let me first give you a flavor, a feeling of like what we used to frame uh, these kind of channels in a new uh, type of um, formalism that goes beyond prior hierarchies. So we want to parameterize a channel definition with the notion of what a channel supports in terms of receiving ciphertext. So for that, we use introduce a support predicate, which kind of takes a network view on the connection and gets us input the send sequence of ciphertext. The received sequence uh, on the receiver's end, uh, including those ciphertexts which have been supported so far, and the next ciphertext arriving, and the support predicate is supposed to determine whether this next ciphertext for this particular channel uh, should be accepted or not. Now, correctness for now only demands that if you have genuine ciphertext being sent, which is supported, they should correctly be decrypted. So what is robustness about? Well, with robustness, we want to capture this intuition to say that malicious packets shouldn't or cannot disturb the expected channel behavior. So if Bob, the receiver, determine a certain uh, pattern of accepting packets, then whether there is an adversarial packet coming in between those shouldn't affect those decisions. Now, of course, today I don't have the time to give you a full uh, definition of how we frame that, but to give you an idea of what how we formalize robustness, um, let's look at a certain, um, like a receiver uh, in the network. And now we define the correct supported subtrace of whatever this receiver gets to see. 
And we feed that subtrace into a kind of local shadow copy, uh, shadow receiver. And by correctness, now we're guaranteed that this shadow receiver will properly decrypt all these messages because all these ciphertext into proper messages um, as they have been supported by the channel. And there is no adversary interaction. Now, robustness essentially demands that the actual receiver comes to the same conclusions for decrypting those messages as this shadow receiver without any adversarial tampering would, would come to. Now, of course, you may ask, what about those gaps? What about the non-supported ciphertext? And this is exactly where robustness is complemented by integrity. Those two are orthogonal, actually. And so integrity would demand that beyond those robust decryptions of supported ciphertext, the channels should reject any uh, of the, like all the other ciphertexts which are not supported, giving you integrity. Now, very briefly, with that, we can form a hierarchy where uh, beyond the classical notions of integrity and uh, confidentiality, we can place robustness, combine this with integrity, or all together having a robust confidential and integrity uh, combining notion, which we can arrive at by either combining passive confidentiality with robust integrity, or if you happen to have already a security result in the classical sense, giving you confidentiality and integrity, and you can also add robustness to that to end up at the strongest, highest notion. OK, so with this hierarchy, let's go back and come back to quick, uh, just to give you a glance of our results um, for the matter of the talk today. Um, you can consider the quick packets to be consisting of an AAD ciphertext and a header. And in this header, we're particularly considering or interested in the packet number, which enters as a sequence number the nonce for the AAD encryption and decryption. Now, uh, Quick only sends a partial packet number, so the few uh, a few um, trailing bits of that packet number, which defines on the receiver side a uh, dynamic sliding window in which packets are um, accepted. Quick also, as said, checks for replay, so there will be a certain replay check window. And now, if you have a packet like the one here arriving with three zero last zero bits, this is of course a toy example then you would sort this in as the packet number eight. And if decryption works properly, we can proceed to the next packet and everything is fine. Now, um, our formalism of support predicates without going into details um, supports this behavior of having dynamic sliding windows, which are defined on the sender side and these replay windows. And uh, I won't go into the details here, but you can find the formalism for that in our paper. Now that we can look at what kind of so now that we have it as a kind of formal model in our, in our setting, what is the security we can establish? Well, we actually show that quick, the quick record protocol gives you robust confidentiality and integrity for the support predicate we just saw. Um, and for that result, we use our hierarchy. So we combine uh, passive confidentiality, CPA security, which comes from the privacy guarantees of the underlying AED scheme with robust integrity, which we can prove based on the authenticity of the underlying AD scheme. Now, there's one important point here, <clears throat> namely that because of the unreliable transport, an adversary is not restricted to a single forgery, like on TLS, for example, but can make multiple forgeries because Quick will throw away a packet that it can't decrypt properly, but it doesn't know whether this was adversarial or actually um, just a network uh, hiccup, kind of. So uh, it will throw away the packet, but continue, which means the adversary, if it's actually trying to forge packets, can also continue to do so, which means in our security reduction to plain authenticity of AAD schemes, we lose a factor in the number of received ciphertext or forgery attempts. Now, this might, to some of you at least, uh, on second or third thought, not seems extremely surprising. Um, However, it wasn't considered so far when we looked at the quick and DTLS drafts uh, back a year ago. Um, while confidentiality limits had been in place, there was nothing about like doing something special about integrity. Yes. So actually, uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah, thanks. So in response to our work, the IETF working groups updated the quick and DTLS 1.3 drafts in order to mandate concrete forgery limits. So now it says you have to count the number of forgery attempts. And if this crosses a certain uh, limit and you have to tear down the connection in order to not get the, have the uh, security margin you have become too small. Extracting the precise limits for that wasn't always extremely easy, let's say. Um, so um, following that, Chris Wood, Martin Something and I 
um, started to look into a CFRG document draft where we want to talk about or when we want to document the usage limits for certain AAD algorithms. The idea being to provide user guidance on those limits for both confidentiality and integrity in a single and multi-key setting and for a number of different standardized AAD algorithms. All right, so to conclude, in summary, um, we introduced robustness as a new first-class security property for channels, where we want to capture this idea of uh, having a guarantee that malicious packets cannot disturb the expected channel behavior. We analyzed the quick and DTLS 1.3 protocols, capturing uh, both their dynamic sliding window um, component as well as replay checking and other things. We confirm that they achieve the intended robust confidentiality and integrity. However, add a certain non-tight security loss, namely a loss linear in the number of uh, received ciphertext and potential forgeries. And this led uh, the working groups to update QUIC and DTLS 1.3 in the draft versions to mandate concrete forgery limits uh, upholding integrity. You can find all details in our full version at uh, ePrint, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have now online or in the chat later. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Felix. That was a great talk. Um, I have the one question posted in the Zoom channel so far. I'll read it out to you uh, from Watson Ladd, who says, uh, in your definition of robustness, I think reordered packets get dropped. I'm curious how your work would apply to something like an encrypted TCP that fixes reordering by releasing data in the right order. Well, so um, so in that uh, definition, essentially the support predicates are something you would specify for the individual protocol uh, that you're looking at. So the example I, I gave you was for QUIC uh, and DTLS, which works relatively similar, I should say. Um, but actually in our paper, we give a range of uh, different support predicates, which uh, capture basically everything from classical TLS uh, to TTLS 1.2 or under other versions where you have different mechanisms in place. So I guess the answer here would be that if the underlying transport does something specific for you in terms of reordering stuff, then you might have a different, you will end up with a different support predicate for the cryptographic channel where you say, even if there's more reordering going on, because this is kind of solved on an underlying layer uh, the channel would support more in that sense. Thanks, Felix. I uh, see no other questions. Um, if there are no others, then I think we're all set here. Appreciate your talk very much. Uh, let's move on to the next talk. Ah, wait, there's another question just coming up from Darcy Litzenberger, who says, does your notion of robustness account for all, at all for scenarios where an attacker selectively drops packets? Yes, so in our model, uh, the adversary is basically controlling the communication between sender and receiver completely. So it's uh, fully uh, capable of, of doing any kind of modifications to the send uh, ciphertext. So you can particularly adaptively drop packages out of what is, what is sent, yes. Wonderful, okay, thanks very much. I think if we're ready, uh, if Robert is ready, we're ready to move on to the second talk. Uh, so our second speaker, is Robert Merger, who will explore with us a novel side channel attack called the raccoon attack that exploits a timing, uh, a timing vulnerability in TLS Diffie Hellman. Go ahead, Robert. Okay. Um, okay, you can hear me and see my slides? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, great. So hi, my name is Robert Merget, and today I'm here to present you a new vulnerability in the TLS specification, we, which we will uh, exploit in the Raccoon attack. This work is a joint research uh, effort with Markus Brinkmann, Nimrod Aviram, Juraj Zamorowski, Johannes Mittmann, and Jörg Schwenk. For this audience, I don't think TS needs much of an introduction. TS is the de facto standard protocol to establish a secure channel, oops, sorry, a secure channel on the internet. TS exists in many versions, but we will focus on TS 102 and older versions for this talk. We will also focus on cipher suits, which negotiate a finite field diffie hellman key exchange. TS uses a handshake to negotiate the cryptographic algorithms and keys. When we look into the inter uh, TS handshake in detail, we'll see that the handshake starts with a client and server exchanging nonces. After that, the server is choosing a private key and sends diffie hellman parameters and its public key together with the signature to the client. 
The client then chooses the private key itself and responds with its own diffie hellman public key. And with that, both parties compute the shared secret G to the power of AB. Once the secret is computed, both parties can use the shared secret, the nonsense, and the label to rewrite the master secret. This master secret is then used to rewrite the keys for the symmetric ciphers. If you look at this design from this high level view, the design looks fine at first glance, but the devil is always in the detail. For our raccoon attack, we will take advantage of two things. Firstly, and what is missing in this kind of depiction, is, def is the fact that the shared secret is converted from a number to a byte sequence, and leading bytes that contain only zeros are stripped from the shared secret before they enter the pseudorandom function. The second thing the raccoon attack takes advantage of is that some servers reuse their diffie hellman public key for multiple connections. This can either be the case because of performance optimizations or due to a static diffie hellman handshake. But why is it problematic that leading zeros are stripped from the shared secret before it enters the pseudorandom function? The core of the problem is that the pseudorandom function is based on hash functions. And these hash functions have a runtime of O of n and not O of 1. This means that the runtime of a hash function is dependent on the input length. We all know that this is intuitively true, as hashing a gigabyte of data is much slower than hashing only a few kilobytes. However, since the shared secret is not of constant length, the execution time of a PIF may vary, depending on the leading bytes of a shared secret. This timing side channel may arise from the number of invoked, invoked uh, compression functions. If a hash function is used at all, the padding or may even arise from bugs in the implementations. These timing side channels are similar to what was exploited in previous Lucky 13 style attacks on the record layer. On a high level, the attack now works as follows. The attacker first has to observe a finite field diffie hellman handshake. He then extracts the client's public key g to the power of a and multiplies it with g to the power of r, where r is a random attacker chosen number. It then sends this new number to the server as part of an attacker-initiated connection together with an invalid finished message. The server which receives this public key will compute the shared secret as g to the power of ab times g to the power of rb. And as you might have noticed, g to the power of ab is the original pre-master secret, and g to the power of rb is a factor the attacker compute, can compute itself. The server will then try to decrypt the message from the attacker and notice that it's not encrypted correctly. The server will then close the connection uh, and or send an alert message. Um, yeah, uh, oops, sorry. Um, okay. In return, the attacker measures the time it took the server to process the public key sent by the attacker. If the attacker thinks that the message was processed faster than usual, the attacker can conclude that the shared secret started with a zero byte. While if a, share, uh, if a server took a little longer, the attacker concludes that the shared secret did not start with a leading zero byte. To compute the original shared secret, the attacker needs to perform the same measurement multiple times to find many values for R for which the resulting shared secret starts with a leading zero byte. Once the attacker has collected enough R values, the attacker can construct an equation system which can be interpreted as an instance of a hidden number problem, where g to the power of AB is the hidden number and g to the power of RB is the public factor. The attacker can then solve this equation system with an HMP solver to retrieve the shared secret g to the power of AB. With this shared secret, the attacker can compute the symmetric keys and break the TIS connection. Due to time constraints, I will not go into the details of the performance of the attack. But let me say this. The runtime of attack varies depending on the length of the diffie hellman keys and the number of leading zero bytes the attacker needs to collect. The number of handshakes the attacker has to perform also varies heavily depending on the side chain quality, the, proxim the proximity of the attacker to the target server, and the number of leading zero bytes the attacker needs to solve the hidden number problem. Generally speaking, the attacker needs to collect roughly 200 equations, which may require millions of connections to the server. For our parameters, the HMP server then required up to three hours to find a solution to the hidden number problem. To estimate the impact of a vulnerability, we analyzed the Alexa top 100,000 servers on the internet for their DHE support and whether they reuse their ephemeral keys or not. We found that roughly one third of the servers supported at least one DHE cipher suit and that 11% of those servers were reusing their diffie hellman keys. But to exploit the vulnerability, it's generally not enough that the server supports the cipher suit. The connection you want to attack also has to naturally negotiate a vulnerable cipher suit. Firefox was the last browser to, support, uh, to drop support for DHE cipher suits, as, and as of 2021, no significant browser supports DHE anymore. The attack is therefore mostly mitigated for browsers. As of countermeasures, there are general lessons to be learned, as the attack technique is not TLS specific. 
Generally, it is a good idea to avoid leaking partial information about secret values. A good design approach to achieve this is to ensure that all secret values are of constant size within memory. This avoids all kinds of shenanigans that can happen when variable length secrets are used within computations. For TLS, clients should avoid using DHE cipher suits from now on, as they cannot know if a server they are connecting to is reusing their ephemeral keys or not. Furthermore, we recommend that servers do not reuse ephemeral keys. Most implementations offer a configuration option for this purpose. Finally, the already unused static Diffie-Hellman handshake should, be, uh, should not be used anymore, as reuse of Diffie-Hellman keys is a key part of the design of those cipher suits. A big question which often comes up in this context is if this also affects elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman handshakes. And luckily, this is not the really the case, as for the elliptic curve handshake, TLS preserves leading zero bytes of a shared secret. But this does not necessarily mean that no side channel for leading zero bytes is present, as a lot of big number libraries do not maintain a fixed size during computation, and leading zero bytes have to be added back in afterwards, which can create a small uh, timing side channel. However, this is not a problem in the specification anymore, but an implementation specific one. But even if this leading zero byte is uh, leaked uh, in, in an elliptic curve if you have a handshake, it is an open question if this is actually exploitable, as the resulting equation system is, as far as we know, currently not solvable, solvable with the given parameters. Last but not least, I would like to talk about how the Raccoon attack interacts with the newest TLS version, TLS 1.3. Fortunately, TLS 1.3 preserves leading zero bytes for ECDH as well as for finite uh, fiat Diffie-Hellman. Therefore, only implementation-specific sidechains may leak the leading zero bytes. David Benjamin introduced this change in draft 13, which prevented the protocol from breaking. Additionally, ephemeral key reuse is less prevalent in TLS 1.3 than it was in TLS 1.2 and before. However, there exist variations of TLS 1.3 which explicitly encourage key reuse and therefore make their implementation potentially affected by the raccoon attack. To conclude, we found a novel flaw in the TLS specification, which has been unnoticed in the specification for over 20 years. Since the flaws in the specification, it is safe to assume that all implementation of TLS DHE, which reuse ephemeral keys, are affected. But there's no need to panic. Although the raccoon attack uses a cool novel technique, exploitation is very difficult, and the circumstances for the attack are, uh, to succeed are com not commonly met. However, the attack is not TLS specific, so we will probably see the same technique applied to other applications in the future. Furthermore, the raccoon attack is, as far as we know, the first practical direct application of a hidden number problem as a cryptoanalytic tool against finite field Diffie-Hellman. This is mostly because no side channel was known which allowed an attacker to access to the leading bytes. If you want to learn more about the raccoon attack, you can find the paper as well as a Q&A on our website, raccoonattack.com. If you want to find out if your own servers uh, are vulnerable to the raccoon attack, you can use our tool TLS scanner, which can also check for some implementation-specific bugs uh, which make the tech more exploitable. Finally, if you want to contact me, you can send me a DM on Twitter or write me an email and use this address. Thanks for listening. And with that, I'm uh, ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Robert. So there are a few questions posted in the channel. I'll uh, walk through them for you. Uh, Jonathan Hoyland asks, did anyone ever check whether post handshake messages could be reordered in DTLS 1.3? Uh, for DTLS 103, I have no clue. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. I um, think there are no um, implementations of DTLS 103 yet, right? <laughs> Kenny Patterson asks, um, gosh, Kenny Patterson said, no, it's a collision terminology, but there's a question. What's the genesis of this security issue? So um, there's actually an interesting story. So I was not aware when the uh, specification was written, but uh, according to a um, um, back uh, in uh, Mozilla uh, wiki, it says that um, the servers actually wanted to implement PKCS3, which is the standard to, uh, on how to implement the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And uh, SSL, the SSL3 specification said implement a standard Diffie-Hellman key exchange and did not explicitly mention if you should keep or uh, not uh, or strip leading zero bytes, but they uh, implicitly assumed uh, that you should. Um, uh, uh, keep the leading zero bytes because they intended PKC is free. Um, but uh, 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 apparently uh, different uh, TS implementers all implemented it uh, the way that it strips leading zero bytes. And then for TLS 1.0, they changed the specification to explicitly mention that uh, leading zero bytes should be stripped so that uh, you can mostly copy paste the code from SSL3 to TLS 1.0. Okay. 
Very good. So another, another question from James Muir, a good one. Has a CV been published for this vulnerability? Yeah, I think there are multiple CVEs. So there's one for from OpenS, uh, and I think uh, there's also another one from F5, and I think there's another one from Mozilla, which is I'm not sure if it's published yet. But uh, you can find the details on both CVEs on our website, racunatech.com. Okay. It looks like Nigel Smart posted a question over in the No Topic channel as well. Um, uh, thanks, Joaquin, for for uh, passing this on. Uh, question is, how many bytes need to be stripped for you to, for you to detect a side channel? Is it a lot or just enough or what? Just, mm -hmm. just one enough? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. So it depends on the modulus length. So some modular lengths are more exploitable than others because they are closer to the critical block borders within the hash functions. And for those, uh, you can usually um, detect it with one byte. Uh, easily over the network, but we were also able to detect a single byte leak in the network for 1024-bit uh, uh, modulus, but it's in our net, uh, in our lab setting, I say, would say, so in a real-world exploit, it's um, not easy to say if it's really exploitable because there's a lot of noise on the network, the server is doing other stuff while you try to measure the side channel, so it's uh, not really clear um, if it's actually exploitable in the real world. Good deal. Thank you. One other question came on the channel. Actually, a couple of things here. Uh, Andrew Cunningham asks, uh, if the DX, uh, if the DH exponent private key is blinded with a random number, does that close the attack? Uh, if it's, especially if that random number is uh, per invocation. Uh, I don't think so, no. Okay. And Andrews Nielsen asks, uh, would a constant time hash remove this time leak? Can you repeat, sorry? Sorry, the, the question was, uh, would a constant time hash remove oh, this time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's a little bit tricky. So um, generally, you, do, you cannot uh, make a hash function constant time. So you would need to know how much uh, bytes, the mo uh, how long the modulus is, and you would need to pass that to the hash function interface. But also, um, it's a little bit tricky because uh, inside the P uh, PRF, is, uh, the hash function is used within HMAC. And uh, the shared secret is actually the key for the HMAC function. And the key has, for example, for SHA384, uh, it has to be hashed if it's um, bigger when, uh, when uh, 1,024 bits. And it does not have to be hashed when it's below 1,024 bits. So um, here, a constant uh, uh, time hash function would not solve a problem entirely. But uh, it's cert uh, certainly possible to write some code which can fix this issue, but uh, I do not think it's a good idea to tackle this issue uh, on an implementation level uh, because DHE is not commonly used anymore and it's uh, really hard to write this uh, code in constant time. So I would just, just suggest to turn off DHE and move to TLS 1.3 or move to uh, elliptic curve if you have them. Okay, Robert, thank you very much for a great talk. Appreciate it very much. Um, I think we're off then to the third speaker. Uh, ah, wait, there is, uh, oh, that's a question for Felix. I won't try to bring it up here. Um, so I'd like to introduce our third speaker, if Julia is ready. Uh, Julia Land is going to introduce the notion of partitioning oracles, a new class of decryption error oracles, and, and then we'll discuss CCA exploits using this construction. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. And see the slides? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about partitioning Oracle tax, and this is joint work with Paul Grubbs and Tom Riston part. So at a high level, this talk will be about why certain kinds of authenticated encryption can be dangerous and lead to vulnerabilities. We'll start by giving an overview of authenticated encryption in general. Here we have two parties, in this case, a client and a server, and they share a key. The client wants to send a, an encrypted message to the server. So the client chooses a nonce and encrypts the plain text message with the key to produce ciphertext. Then sends the ciphertext to the server who can then decrypt to recover the plain text message. And of course we expect that the, uh, an attacker 
who gets the ciphertext won't be able to recover the underlying plaintext without the key. And um, authenticated encryption, also called AAD, has uh, many popular schemes out there, such as AES GCM, XALSA 20 Poly 1305, and ChaCha 20 Poly 1305, as well as AES GCM SIV. And they're popular for many reasons. They're efficient, they're standardized, and they have library implementations. They also guarantee many security properties, such as confidentiality and integrity, as well as being proven CCA secure. However, all of these AAD schemes listed here um, don't target one security property, and that is robustness, which is also called committing AAD. In a non-committing AAD scheme, if you have two keys, you can produce a ciphertext that can successfully decrypt under both keys. So here we have a client who now knows two keys and might not know which key the server has, which it will use to decrypt. But the client can simply send the ciphertext that decrypts under both keys, and now the server will be able to successfully decrypt. Notice that this means that in non-committing AAD, there's no guarantee the sender actually knows the exact key the recipient will use to decrypt. And for the most part, this hasn't been considered an essential security goal, except in settings like uh, moderation for encrypted messaging. But today we'll talk about why non-committing AAD can be dangerous, and that's because of something we call partitioning Oracle attack. In this setting, we have a server when, with an associated password, and the server accepts encrypted queries which it then decrypts using a password-based non-committing AAD scheme, something like ASGCM. The attacker wants to recover the server's password. And to help with this, the attacker has access to a password dictionary, which they could have gotten from leaked password data. And the server's password is a member of the password dictionary, although of course the attacker doesn't know which one. And the attacker could make a single query for each password in the dictionary, but this could be prohibitively large and inefficient. So instead, the attacker can split the password dictionary into two sets. And then the attacker can create a ciphertext such that it can decrypt successfully under all passwords in one set, but not in the other. We call this ciphertext a splitting ciphertext because it splits the password dictionary into two sets. And we say that has an associated value of k equal to four because it can decrypt under four keys. Now the attacker queries the ciphertext to the server. The server fails to decrypt so sends back to the uh, attacker that there was a decryption error. Now the attacker knows that the server's password can't have been in this first set and therefore can completely eliminate this first set of passwords, thereby reducing the password dictionary by half. This means that with each query, the attacker can eliminate half of the password dictionary every time. The attacker can continue with this binary search-like technique until they recover the target password. This means only big O of login the size of the password dictionary number of queries is needed to learn the password. This is an exponential speed up over a brute force dictionary attack. Of course, pass password dictionaries can be extremely large and it might not be practical to make such a query. But if we consider a more practical value such as k equal 5,000, we see that for every query, the attacker can still eliminate 5,000 passwords every time until the attacker reaches the correct set of 5,000 passwords after which the attacker can proceed with the binary search-like technique. This still offers a good speed up over brute force. Partitioning Oracle attacks rely on two things. One, building a splitting ciphertext that can decrypt under k different keys, and two, having access to partitioning Oracle. We'll start with this first point, which we call key multi-collision attacks. GLR first showed an attack against AESGCM for k equals two, and we'll generalize this attack against AESGCM for any value k. AES-GCM is really encrypted than MAC. For encryption, it uses counter mode encryption of AES. And for the MAC, it uses a G, it uses G hash, which is a polynomial MAC. The attack algorithm itself will take k different keys and will output a ciphertext that decrypts under all k keys. The length of the ciphertext will be k 16 byte blocks. And the attack algorithm will run in time big O of k squared. What makes this attack algorithm work is that Ghash is a polynomial MAC. This reduces finding the ciphertext to solving a set of linear equations. We'll run through a small example now. So let's say we take in as input an arbitrary nonce, 
an authentication tag, and three keys. Our goal is to compute a ciphertext that decrypts under all three keys. We'll pre-compute values h sub i, p sub i, and l. These are constants in our system of equations. And the ciphertext blocks will be our variables. Here you can see we've set up a system of three equations um, with three unknowns. When we reduce, we get this system of equations. You'll see on the left-hand coefficient matrix is a special kind of matrix called a Vandermond matrix. This means we can use polynomial interpolation to solve, which is much more efficient. When we implemented this using SageMath and Magma, uh, we performed timing experiments on a Linux desktop, the results of which you can see here in this table. We found that we could make a ciphertext that decrypts under greater than 4,000 keys and in less than 30 seconds. And there do exist faster algorithms out there that do polynomial interpolation in big O of k log squared k time instead of big O of k squared time. So we could create multi-collisions much faster than this too. We also found that XALSA 20 poly 1305, CHA-CHA 20 poly 1305, and ASGCM SIV were all also vulnerable to key multi-collision attacks. However, these attacks are more complex and less scalable than those for ASGCM. Now that we've covered key multi-collision attacks, we'll move on to talking about getting access to partitioning oracle. In other words, where do partitioning oracles arise? We looked at two schemes in depth. One was ShadowSox proxy servers for UDP. Here we showed a proof of concept attack against a ShadowSox server where we successfully recovered its password using a partitioning Oracle attack. The second was early implementations of the opaque asymmetric PAKE protocol. We found that many of these early implementations went against the protocol specification to use a non-committing AAD scheme, mainly because of the ease of use of non-committing AAD schemes that I mentioned earlier. This left these schemes vulnerable to partitioning Oracle attacks. And there are other possible partitioning Oracles out there, such as in hybrid encryption. For instance, we found that the hybrid public key encryption scheme could be vulnerable, which has now since been updated, as well as the gay file encryption tool, which has also since been updated. In addition, some Kerberos drafts, which haven't been adopted, as well as JavaScript object signing and encryption, and potentially an anonymity systems. For instance, an attacker could use partitioning oracles to learn which public key a recipient is using from a set of public keys, therefore learning the identity of the recipient. Uh, two minutes, Julia. Okay. So the question is, what do we do? Our paper is the latest in a growing body of evidence that non-committing AAD can be dangerous. In fact, after we published our results, there was another paper that came to the same conclusion. But when we ask which committing AAD scheme do we use, there's no easy answer because currently no committing AAD scheme is standardized. Ultimately, the conclusion here is we need a committing AAD standard and it should be the, it should be the default choice for AAD. So to conclude, we describe partitioning Oracle attacks which exploit non-committing AAD to recover secrets and we discussed how widely used AAD schemes are not committing. This means that partitioning Oracle attacks can be used to recover passwords from real uh, schemes and protocols out there. And ultimately, our recommendation is to design and standardize committing AAD for deployment. If you'd like to read more details, the full paper is up on ePrint. And I'd like to thank my co-authors, as well as all those named here, who provided helpful feedback on our paper. Thank you for listening, and I'll now take questions. Thank you, Julia. There are a few questions on the channel. I'm going relay, relay those to you. Uh, one is uh, uh, Kenny Patterson asks, does the magic ciphertext need to, need to be computed in an online manner for the attacks you have in mind? No, they can be computed offline. Uh, for instance, in our shadow socks uh, attack, we, we computed all of the ciphertext in advance, and then online we queried later. Great. Uh, question from James Muir is, uh, does AES CCM uh, show vulnerability to these same multi-key attacks? Um, we haven't looked at that. Um, we, we haven't looked at AES CCM yet, uh, but we could certainly look at that in the future. Cool. Okay. Those are the only questions I see asking for audio relay on the chat side. And I, so I believe that uh, finishes this talk. Thanks yeah. very much, Julian. Dave, there's a question from Serge Vodny in the um, in the Zoom chat. Um, so maybe this is a point worth reminding everybody, please use the social app if you can for posting your questions. 
Um, but maybe we can take Serge's question if we have time. Sure. Oh, there's one more question here for, from uh, Sadie G for Julia. Have you considered reaching out to standards bodies like NIST about the lack of uh, guidance on this problem? Um, we've been uh, speaking with the CFRG about this and um, we hope to communicate more with these bodies about uh, proceeding with committing AEAD. Okay. And one more question, are there any common AEAD schemes uh, here today that uh, appear to be committing? Uh, one is, for instance, Encrypt and HMAC. We found that this didn't have a formal standard. Um, there were some informal standards out there. This also doesn't have a, a nice implementation such as AES-GCM. Um, so certainly in, in many of these libraries, they lack a, a committing AAD scheme you could simply call such as, that you, nowadays you can call for XALSA 20 Poly 1305. Okay. Uh, let's see, another question from uh, Sophie. A AES GCM SIV needs uh, just one bit to be brute forced for this. Is that enough to prevent it? Um, what, or what do you mean by one needs one bit to be brute forced? Could you elaborate? Oh, Sophie, do you want to speak to that? Uh, well, I guess I'll say that for ASGCM SIV, um, it's uh, it it does have a, this a one bit when you decrypt that it checks. Um, this still enables the attack because you could, uh, in an untargeted way, split the ciphertext based off of whether the correct bit is decrypted. I'm not sure if that addresses the question. Anyway, follow that one up offline. Um, one more question from Marcus Brinkman. Um, so a question about. Now, why would we use an active partition partitioning attack if we can do a passive exhaustive search instead? Uh, you could, in, in some of these cases, uh, you could do a passive attack. But for instance, if you aren't able to um, perform the passive attack, for instance, you need to listen on the network to grab the ciphertext. In some of these contexts, it might be easier to perform an active query, such as with shadow socks, um, in which case the partitioning oracle attack uh, would be better than this offline attack. Okay. And one last, last comment, not question, was that uh, it might be worth looking at the NIST LWC candidates uh, as options here. Okay, that's great. I'll take a look at that. Okay, I think that's all we have on the channel. Um, thank you again, Julia. Great talk. Thank you. Let's move on to the last talk. Uh, our final speaker in this session is Tom Wiggers, and he's going to present KEM TLS which is an alternative to the TLS 1.3 handshake that uses key encapsulation mechanisms uh, instead of signatures for server authentication. Uh, Tom, uh, we can see your slides. Yeah, I had to figure out where the mute button went if you start sharing your screen. Um, okay, you can see my slides, but where are my slides on my laptop? There we go. Okay, um, it seems uh, that we are slightly ahead of schedule. So uh, if you want to ask extra questions, you can do so on, uh, on Zulip. Uh, my co-authors are also there, uh, so they can join in into the discussion. Uh, and with that, I'd like to open this talk about uh, post-quantum TLS, but we're going to do TLS without handshake signatures. So that's a bit of a weird thing for a lot of people. And uh, yeah. We have had a few talks about TLS already, and you all know that it sort of looks like this. So you have a key exchange uh, with some uh, G to the X's and stuff like that. And then you send over uh, a signature uh, that's been produced by um, the secret key that corresponds to a public key in a certificate. How do you make this post quantum? Because obviously we want to protect ourselves from the quantum monster that's gonna eat us all in a few years. If we don't do anything about this, well, you could just write quantum in front of everything, post quantum in front of everything. So you could replace the key exchange by a, a CHEM, a key encapsulation mechanism, uh, many of which are proposed in the NIST competition. And you could use a post quantum signature scheme for the signature in the handshake. This is all good, right? Um, this has also been uh, studied in the literature a few times, um, but there are some problems with this approach. So post-quantum signatures 
are both quite a bit big, often they are uh, a bit slower than CHEMS, uh, or they require your a bit of extra code because uh, entities need to be bespoke for every algorithm, for example, stuff like that. So there is some, uh, some motivation to try to get rid of them. So what we are proposing is to use CHEMS for authentication instead. So what is a CHEM for those that haven't seen it before? It's a primitive that uh, has a few functions. So you have a key gen and then an encapsulate operation that gives you a ciphertext and the other party uh, with the secret key can use that ciphertext to retrieve the same shared secret. And you could use that to create an authentication protocol if you know the other party's secret key. And then both, because you can both derive the same shared secret, uh, Peter in this example knows that Douglas has access to that secret key and you know that Douglas is who he claims to be. The problem with doing this in TLS is that the server uh, has a, a public key that the client doesn't already know. So if you would just want to do this naively, you need an extra round trip. And that was what the TLS 1.3 proposal was all about, fewer round trips. But we can solve this problem. If we, instead of an explicitly authenticated key exchange, use implicitly authenticated key exchange, we can have the server encapsulate to the, uh, the client encapsulate to the server's long-term public key, uh, but it does not need to wait until they get the Mac to confirm before they start sending data. That's been done before in a bunch of protocols, both in literature and in, in practice. So let's look at our proposal in some detail. So we start out with an ephemeral key exchange with a CAM, a post-quantum CAM, and the server sends over uh, its certificate for privacy reasons because it says what the server is, etc., uh, encrypted over this uh, ephemeral public key. And then we do the authentication by encapsulating to that certificate's public key and then decapsulating uh, on the server side. And because then they can both derive that same shared secret, we know that the server is who they claim to be. And this allows the client still to send data before receiving the service key confirmation because this client knows that only uh, the real server can decrypt what I'm sending to you. We need to pick some algorithms to do this. So we need CHEMS and they should be fast ideally and they should also have small public keys and ciphertext. Root certificates are a bit interesting because they are already present on the client and we only care about the signature size. The public key is already there. And for intermediate certificates, we need both the uh, public key and the signature to be reasonable uh, because we need to send that over. We did measurements. This is on an emulated network. And uh, you see here that the uh, it's slightly hard to read. I apologize, but the uh, this one uses the lithium for authentication. This one uses Kyber for authentication. And you can see that the Kyber variant is quite a bit smaller than the Kyber, the lithium variant. Similarly, with this version that uses Entru instead of Falcon. And they also save a bit of time. This is an interesting counterexample because Psyche uh, the chem is so slow that um, if you swap out psych for a signature scheme, you actually get faster, but that's a psych specific problem. In general, we see that we get a bit faster. Size optimized variants uh, require a lot fewer communication and something that was less visible in this graph, but is still true is that because chems are a lot more computationally efficient, they, we use a lot fewer CPU cycles while not needing extra round trips. But that was me uh, measurements on a server with emulation and Cloudflare contacted us, can we help you? And we said, well, we might be able to do something here. Um, we have started effort with Cloudflare to uh, start doing measurements in the real world. For that effort, we have a implementation now of ChemTLS uh, in the Go standard library that lives at uh, Cloudflare's fork of, uh, of the Go. Uh, stuff. Uh, this is based on dedicated credentials because we couldn't find a, a certificate authority that was crazy enough to give us a camp public key in a certificate yet. So instead we are using this uh, draft that proposes to allow you to delegate uh, from uh, normal TLS certificates and then we can put whatever public key in there what we want. And we've also implemented client authentication. 
And we intend to use this implementation to do measurements on real networks. So for example, between Cloudflare uh, data centers. And we want to measure more aspects than what we've shown before. So handshake time is fun, but there's also other things that are interesting. For example, how many connections can you run in parallel? If you have a, a server uh, that runs a popular website, um, you want to be able to handle a lot of connections at the same time. And it would be annoying if going post quantum means you need to buy 10 more servers. So we want to look at stuff like that. And we really hope to be able to report more uh, results soon. Uh, this was uh, this talk. We hope that this interests you to uh, go read our paper. Um, we, uh, ChemTLS allows you to authenticate via CHEMS, and we do this implicitly while preserving the ability of the client to do a request after a single round trip. Um, the paper was presented at CCS, you can find it here, um, and the full version with proofs, and I also put it in my username for Zoom, is at uh, ISCR ePrint at uh, this location. And um, we're very happy to say that Cloudflare is helping us investigate how ChemTLS will work in the real world, and the uh, experimental implementation, and uh, I'm sure we are happy to also receive feedback, uh, lives in this branch at the Cloudflare Fork of Go. We hope to have results soon, uh, TM. Um, so keep an eye on the Cloudflare research blog. And with that, I think that I can answer hopefully a lot of questions. Thank you, Tom. Um, so we do have one question on the, on the Zoom side uh, so far. Um, so the question is uh, from Chelsea Conla, who asks, have you thought about applications of these results to other protocols, not just two-party key exchange? In principle, the idea of uh, ChemTLS is, of course, very simple. Uh, you prove possession of a uh, secret key that corresponds to a public key that is known. Um, so yes, this is applicable the general idea at least is applicable to a lot of different protocols. In fact, you might even uh, in most key exchange protocols that rely on uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman or normal Diffie-Hellman, but not a non-interactive uh, variant of it, uh, you could uh, use similar uh, strategies to use CHEMS for authentication. Um, in general, um, I, I haven't written anything down on it, but um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of applications where you could uh, use CHEMS uh, instead of signatures. As long as both parties are online, uh, it is possible. And especially if you're not bound to doing a single round trip. The only problem is if you have a interact, uh, non-interactive key exchange, uh, because then you need Seaside and Seaside is uh, complicated. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, James Muir asks, what post-quantum KEM scheme seems to best fit your application in TLS? Um, so this is based on our uh, measurements on a server that had a, quite a bit of data, uh, uh, the nice CPU, all that stuff. So this is not a full answer because this doesn't cover any embedded stuff or whatever at all. But I would say that... Um, Psych is too slow um, and that uh, the most promising candidates are probably uh, the lithium and falcon um, because you still need some post-quantum sig signature scheme for the certificate chain uh, for that part. And then uh, most chems are fast enough. So falcon is nice uh, on uh, servers that ha have hardware acceleration because you kind of need that with falcon. Um, to use as, uh, sorry, Entru is uh, fast, uh, Kyber is fast, they are equally fast, more or less. Uh, the difference there is so marginal that you can use either, they are slightly different in size. Um, yeah, the paper has an overview of uh, a bunch of algorithms that we measured, uh, more or less you can just go for the smallest ones. Uh, and if you have optimized implementations, they usually perform more or less the same because you shouldn't forget that if you have a network latency of a few milliseconds, 
then differences in nanoseconds in terms of the computation time for most of these primitives are fairly okay. Um, yeah, the, the, so my, my advisor is Peter Schwab, so I should probably now say that Kyber is the best chem, but uh, yeah. <laughs> In fact, a, a question just came up about Kyber. Uh, the question for, from lots of lad is what about uh, SQLI sign plus Kyber? Um, how, would that, how well would that work in this application? Um, so I, this is the part where I admit that I don't know what SQI sign is, so I should probably go look into that. Um, it might be good to follow that one up offline then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. But yeah, Sorry. I am not sure what that is. So it would be nice if you have something that you can sort of add on to existing TLS. Uh, for a practical point of view. Um, so we that's also why in our paper we stay close to the original TLS 1.3 stuff uh, as much as possible. Um, but yeah. Okay, there's one other question here uh, from Britta Hale. Uh, looks like for, uh, for Tom, your protocol uses a server certificate as well as the delegated KDM certificate as part of post-quantum security on those certificate chains, are you proposing that the entire chain would use a post-quantum KDM or would, for example, the server cert still be a, a post-quantum signature? Yeah, so the um, with delegated credentials, uh, that is mainly just to power our experiment right now. Because um, if you start sending over both a CAM public key and a um, leaf certificate and an intermediate certificate, uh, then you still need both the leaf and the uh, intermediate certificates to be uh, signature schemes because they need to certify the uh, uh, delegated credential in the end. So that's not the most efficient option. But um, if you want to go forward with ChemTLS uh, into the future, then it would be necessary to get... Uh, CA certified CAM public keys in certificates, which actually is a very interesting problem because there's a lot of things about the uh, way that the TLS PKI works that rely on the uh, certificate being able to sign things. So for example, a revocation or uh, even just the certificate request uh, package is also signed by the public key. So if you use public keys that cannot sign things, uh, you need to solve a few problems there. And that's also something that I haven't had time to really figure out yet, but it's definitely interesting for future work. Okay, that's the last question posed on the channel. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, looks like at this point we are done with uh, session one on secure channels. I think next up in about five minutes time is election award ceremony. And I think uh, Dan Bonet is chairing that one. Yep. Well, I think, uh, with that, we'll close out session one of RWC 2021. Thanks, everyone.